Hey there, welcome to Over the Horizon. Well, there's a lot been happening uh, at a humanoid robot, uh, robotics company called Agility. I don't know if you've been following the news, but uh, there's been a few layoffs, unfortunately. Uh, I guess it's part of the evolution of a company. Um, and Nathan Peterson is um, one of the engineers uh, who was laid off, part of the original team. And I'm lucky to have him on the Over the Ryden podcast today, along with Scott Walter, the internet's guru and go-to guy for all things humanoid bots. Uh, thank you for your time. Nathan, just very quickly, I don't want to dwell mm -hmm. much on it, but there have been layoffs. It's mm -hmm. not been very pretty. What's been your experience? Um, well, I can't share too much, but I can say that, you know, I was surprised, but, you know, I will remain probably one of the biggest cheerleaders for agility. Um, I had a great time almost nothing but great memories and experiences over four and a half years. And I think they've got, you know, such a unique product and market fit. Um, yeah. And then I just, you know, I'm excited to go, you know, find my own path, you know, in the legged robotic space. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was gonna say, uh, everyone there is great. You know, the people that um, left or the people, you know, there are absolutely amazing. Um, some of my favorite people I've ever worked with. There's there's actually been a lot happening with agility mm -hmm. because uh, I think in September last year you had uh, uh, this uh, new ho robot factory um, that was announced in Oregon, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so we are based in a very as I say, you know, I, I tell people I'm in Portland, but I'm like an hour and a half south. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Corvallis, where Oregon State University is, so that's kind of where we spun out of. Um, but our actual office is in Tangent just because there was a big warehouse space. Um, right. And now that has become solely engineering. Um, and then all of production sourcing is now in this, what we call the Salem, and we call it the RoboFab. Um, so this Robo big Fab, building, right. yep. And uh, there's also been a lot uh, more that's been happening because uh, there have been tie-ups uh, with um, Manhattan Associates. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting. Um, uh, just. I guess this is 2.0 for the company. Yeah, I, I was gonna say honestly, I'm not part of the team that uh, that works on our like you know warehouse management, but I can say it was the biggest, maybe maybe one of two or three of the biggest surprises I learned. You know, way back when we were like 20 people, you know, we were just all working on a robot. When we went to customers, they went, "How do I control this thing? How do I send it commands?" and yeah. um, Melanie from Fetch Robotics, she started Fetch Robotics. The very first thing she said when she joined was the warehouse management system is the hardest part. And she said at Fetch, they, you know, they just, that's their continuous job was working on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and this is footage um, from a deployment in an Amazon warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, we were, I was gonna say, it was, you know, it was amazing to do it, but then we, I was so glad, you know, some customers don't want to share footage, yeah. but we, we had a good agreement with Amazon. We were able to share um, how well it went. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, it's brilliant. Um, and, you know, we've done a few chats on the podcast with, uh, with Scott and it's mm -hmm. because companies share uh, these videos that we learn so much about the process. It's almost like, you know, a total uh, paradigm shift in how companies approach engaging with the public in yeah. general. We saw that first with SpaceX, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. access to to Starbase and, and Elon himself come out. But and then we've seen it with Optimus. But it's so great to look at companies like Agility also and Figure, of course, and all the others that have been bumping out these videos, sharing the uh, the, the the process of evolution. Um, I'm very curious about the form factor because it's very different mm -hmm. from, from all the, the other. The, the, the form factor is so funny to talk about because it, it's just like a consequence of like, you know, 10, 15 years of like, just, you know, just like little things happening. So yeah. Jonathan Hurst, one of the co-founders, um, you know, he was originally at Carnegie Mellon um, and then went to Oregon State University to start his own lab. And he was all about, uh, cable drives and springs, and you'll see it in the history of the old robots. You can see them exposed um, and like very back drivable. And, you know, we almost make fun of them. The number one word he says is transparency, as in, you know, back drivability and the drive being able to feel forces. Yeah. Um, so way, you know, when I started Cassie, the two-legged robot with no arms had already shipped to customers. 
Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people said, oh, why does it have bird legs? Um, but really, we didn't set out to design bird legs or be different than other companies. Um, it was just, we, you know, we, we had bipedal legs on a robot called Atreus, which is this, you know, big trapezoidal robot with, uh, it's even hard to describe, it has like dual knees. Um, and just from the physics of it, and because they wanted to put springs in, like the design just happened to resemble an avian leg, like a bird leg. So it was totally not by design. Um, and then as a consequence of that, we've kept it. And one of the things we learned is like, even in this video, you'll see the robot kind of like, I say crouch down, but it, it doesn't have any torso degree of freedom. It can collapse the legs all the way to the ground and yeah, keep them out of the way. And that's just something we learned after we built the robot um, and customers loved it immediately. It was so funny. I just remember like the day someone did it for the first time. And I was like, why would anyone use, <laughs> why would anyone do that? I was gonna say like, we had to make sure that the knee was strong enough to collapse the leg all the way down. Um, and it became like a requirement. I'm like, this is silly. And then now it's like one of the main features of the robot. Yeah. So um, let me bring in Scott here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Scott, you've been uh, reviewing and talking about all of these robotics companies. And if you could just, what are, what are your thoughts about the form factor? Uh, it's been very interesting looking at the evolution of this, but it's so different because it, it just piques your curiosity. It, it does, because I come from like a simulation and robot kinematics background. Mm -hmm. So I'm always interested in looking at the linkage designs and, and why mm -hmm. you choose certain degrees of freedom over others. And so it was a curious bot when, uh, you know, really, let's say, came kind of out of stealth mode, maybe a little bit over a year ago um, at the, I think the first trade fair. I'm not sure if that was like PAC Expo. Uh, that it was. Uh, at, um, we, showed, we showed this version at ProMat, which was like a. ProMat, um, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I was, the two, two of them mixed up. Oh, you're good. You're good. Ago. Yeah. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the first time, and it's like, well, this is kind of curious, and then learning a bit more about the design, mm -hmm. and you can see the practicality of it, and then listening to, um, you know, Dr. Hurst's uh, explanation mm -hmm. of the whole thing, and, you know, since then, I'm like, well, you guys literally designed it from the ground up. I mean, you, you, you thought about the walking problem first, and then mm -hmm. now we, we've got that solved. How do we take care of the rest of it, where everyone else is coming in literally from the top down? They're, they're working on the arms, and like, oh, the mobility, the bipedalism, yeah, we'll yeah. take care of that when, when it's the right time. And so it's interesting to see that convergence. And so I've looked at both designs and I was kind of thrown off um, balance once when you were doing a review of, of, of the agility. And I, had, I thought I had understood everything about it. And suddenly it was like mm -hmm. the latest version because an earlier version was just a four-armed robot, correct? Was a, uh, sorry. Oh, or sorry, uh, sorry, a four degree of freedom. The, the arms only had four degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah. So and, the, and um, was, yeah. In, in, internally, I, I don't know how we're going to handle this marketing wise. The, the four DOF armed version of Digit, which does not have um, the head on top, mm -hmm. we call that Digit V3 internally. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we are, we're, we're keeping the, you know, we're just going to call this version you see here, we're just going to call this Digit as it's our, are going to be our mass produced yes. version. Yes, yes, yes. So, so the other one that had the, the four degree feet of arm, mm -hmm. it was like a unique approach to the shoulder. And I absolutely loved the shoulder design. And I was like, oh, was man. raving about I the mean, way it was because you had it. I'm going to, yeah. You you had what was almost a pseudo scapula kind of movement that was in there because mm -hmm. everyone talks about oh you, you'd like to have that extra degree of freedom that's in there mm -hmm. and so I was really intrigued by it and then when I heard you went to uh, to six degrees of freedom it's like oh it's cooler and then they went ahead and they, they put the wrist on there great and then I switch. saw it, yeah. like, wait a minute it's the standard <laughs> the pitch down. so it's like I love that old shoulder why didn't you hold on to it so if there's anything um, you I, I, yeah. about why. You, you decided to change that shoulder. What was wrong with the original one? Because yeah. in many ways, I like that approach. I'm gonna tell the engineer right after this that you really liked his arm because one person designed the entire arm mm -hmm. um, originally. So I can't, I don't actually know why the order was in the original four DOF. It was just, I, I think it was just how it worked out. And it was just, it replicated the order that the leg um, we used to call them the gimbal mm. motors, like above the knee. It was in the same order. The reason we changed it, though, was because the um, the range of motion is better on this kind of standard arrangement. Mm. Yep. And this is something we kind of see, like, it's funny because, like, we were way different. We wouldn't even call, we used to not even call our robots humanoids. We'd be like, no, 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 we're, we're bipedal. We just have two legs. We're so different. But as we've been working, you know, 
in tuning stuff, we found, oh, some of these things do make sense. It's kind of funny. It's like the robot's evolving to be slightly more human. Um, but we're not, yeah, we're definitely not just trying to imitate a human for aesthetics or because we don't want to think about it. We, we found like through practice that like we could reach better with that different shoulder arrangement. Okay. That, that's interesting. Cause I've, that's been sort of the go-to solution for the shoulders. And I mm -hmm. understand why a lot of companies do it, but for me, I'm still not satisfied with it. I think there's, mm -hmm. there's just going to be a better way to be able to do the shoulder. But right now it's, it's very easy to kind of do that because everyone understands it and the, the way you get it set up, you, you say range of motion, everything else. Uh, you then have the challenges to go with the wrist um, mm -hmm. because you, with a Ford off one, you didn't have the wrist to worry about. Yep. Um, and so you, you basically have, it's a seven degree of freedom uh, arm, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, because you get three in the top, one in the elbow, and then basically three in the wrist. So you have one yeah. more degree of freedom than you really need, but people don't understand yeah. that redundancy is actually very important to be the able redundancy to do is very good. Type of, yeah. And it's because it allows you to swing the shoulder, the, the elbows around. Otherwise, the mm -hmm. elbows will be kind of in a fixed position. Mm -hmm. where you don't really want them. And sometimes you need to be able to get the elbow out of the way. That is exactly. And then sometimes we still see that problem where the elbow can get in the way. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the version with seven DOF and we call that end effector. It's going to be called like a uh, modular end effector one in the future, but it's, it, we call that not like the wrist. We, we call it the paddle. Yeah. Um, the reason we went to this is because it's this exact use case with the four DOF arm. We could only grab from the side, which worked great. Uh, you had to put a lot of pressure on the side of the totes and boxes, which could deform them. But so we, we originally said we need just one more doff at the end to kind of get the lip of the tote. So you'll see it. That's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the only time it'll move is to fold into the lip of the tote. Um, I would say, you know, we, and then even in the, as I say, so this is our solution right now. And then at Modex, which just happened a couple months ago, we showed, an optional end effector with another degree of freedom. So it has a more, it has like kind of like a pincher and that'll be called um, end effector two in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and, and that was, and that was the same thing to kind of get the lip of the tote and be able to pull it from this wall, very specific to this wall. Cause trying to fit your hands between the totes from the side was just not really possible there. I think, you know, there's like millimeter gap, in some applications. Right, so yeah, you, need, you need to be able to slide it in. You can't come in like this, you've got to, be, so you need that degree of freedom to be able to line up parallel to it and go in. And yep. whether you need that that yaw on the wrist, that's that's always like been a big discussion whether mm -hmm. you need it. You need it a little bit. It's not a whole lot of movement, but you need it when you yep. need it. <laughs> and yeah, it's one and, of those that you yep. could get rid of it because the shoulder redundancy almost gives you the movement you need, but not quite the finesse that you like to have. You do that by then sacrificing where the elbow is going. Yeah, and as I was gonna say, even as, yeah, and once again, like even to this day, yeah, sometimes the elbows will kind of kick out a little bit. So that is something still in progress. You know, we're always trying to refine the design to make it work in this use case. Yeah, and that that's I mean that's sometimes that's just the control solution that you're trying to yes. come up with. You're trying to go to a particular position, and it's like, oh, what what should I do with the elbow? And you try to guess at a solution. Because you, live, you literally have an infinite number of solutions to pick mm -hmm. from, and you don't know. And that's where a neural net would help because it has a better idea that I've tried doing those solutions myself with the heuristic, and everyone's <laughs> always walking around with like the elbows like this. And like, oh, like, yeah. Control, get and then you just come up with these. I think there's one of them that literally is, we call it the rule of thumb because it has mm -hmm. something to do with the, the direction of your thumb and making the, the thumb direction defines like this plane. And from that, you make sure that your elbow is actually in that plane. So. That's one way of kind of being able to solve it, but it's, it's still, it's imperfect because, you know, it is a rule of thumb. So it's, it's good 80% of the time. And there's that 20% where you got to do something because you're either self intersecting something, the elbow is coming yeah. in on you like that, or like you say, it's, it's bumping out like that. In many ways, I've kind of thrown my arms up in the air on that one and just say, ah, no pun intended on that. It's like, just let the neural <laughs> net figure that out uh, rather than trying to go in mm -hmm. and come up with the heuristic because, you know, the code is actually pretty simple. It's, it's not that many lines of code to solve the math. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh, which of these infinite number of solutions is the best one I got to pick yeah. one from? Yeah, the, the nice thing about ARMS is on Digit's ARM, it's all serial links. So it's like one after the other. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, no four bar or anything. So the software isn't too crazy. I mean, manipulation is still wildly difficult, but like for the, the kinematics. 
I'm so used to doing like leg stuff where it has this crazy far bar, it had springs, it has a you know the two off inferential foot, and like the math to do all that was so difficult. Sometimes yeah. I'm just like throw that into a throw that into yeah throw that into a neural network and let it figure out <laughs> how yeah. to make that because, work. Because yeah, you have the parallel kinematics is never fun. Some, sometimes I think in this case you can solve the parallel kinematic problem there, but there are other cases where it's you have to iterate. There there is no like yeah. closed form solution there. Like you you just got to go through like. Um, like a Stuart platform or some of these like spider robots, everyone said are what they call the Delta robot, that, mm -hmm. that thing it has, it's, it's ironic. A parallel kinematic can have an inverse kinematic solution, but the forward solution, which is usually the easy one is like impossible. That's the one you have to iterate on and, and drives you crazy, which is why you see some of these Sims. A lot of times those four bar mechanisms are breaking apart in the simulation. Thanks. It's too I, hard to figure out what you have to do to yep. get the thing to come together. So not not at agility, but I um I, I kind of want to just learn more software because I'm an electrical engineer. Yeah. I enrolled part time at OSU Oregon State, and they did all reinforcement learned and all sim. So we literally like threw the model of the robot into a simulator and had it learn how to walk. Um, and yeah, some simulators cannot solve that four bar. Like um, I was gonna say, you you just pulled up the video with the Nvidia demo. That was the hardest part was solving that four bar. Um, and I would say agility now is a very yeah. close partnership. Yeah. And, and, there, and, and there were uh, errors in that in video video. You could see that the knees or like actually that, that was, I actually, the, uh, we the talked back in, of the ankle, whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever you call yeah. that joint. Technically it's not the knee, but everyone thinks it's the knee yeah. was on resting on the floor and the feet went up in the air. <laughs> and then when the transition happened, it was yeah. floating for a bit. And it's like, wait a minute, where's G? <laughs> What's his <laughs> gravitational acceleration? And then eventually it came down in contact. Um, as we talked about it internally, we actually think that was just like a, a, a mistake on our part. Like we sent the wrong video. Um, we do have, a, I was going to say, we had some earlier footage in the NVIDIA where it solves the four bar and the feet are actually on the ground. I think that was just like an on us mistake. Like, um, but that is, I mean, that is almost what happens when we do that wrong. Um, just, well, well, just, you're, not, yeah. you're not the only one. If you go, I think about a year ago, there was a Tesla mm -hmm. video where they were showing um, the teacher who was, who was rigged up with the VR equipment moving yeah. around and they see the simulation of it. And then of course, you know, they have kind of a four bar mechanism that's for the wrist, which is similar to your ankle in a way. You yeah. know, it's a similar kind of yeah, problem. Very similar. And those things were not be staying connected. Those connecting rods oh. were floating around. They were, yeah, okay. they were yeah. because- I didn't even notice that. Is, is, yeah, because the way they, they treat it mm -hmm. is like a serial link mechanism for the, the simulation. And so they were looking at the joints as if those were drivers. And that's if, and then you can mm -hmm. make these as like followers just to fill in the picture to make it look right. So I was like, oh, wait a minute, they get that part wrong there because actually <laughs> it's the other way around. So yeah. I, I just, I see these details because I have to worry about it in my own simulation software all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that is important because in, in the end, you're, you're trying to figure out what your drive mechanism is supposed to be doing. I mean, you just can't have it go along for the ride. And <laughs> what I'd like to do is like on, on kind of the topic of actuators, mm -hmm. Um, I think they're all rotary actuators, correct? Are there any linear yeah, actuators? Yes. I say I can say, yeah, they're definitely all rotary actuators. Yep. And that is a decision we made. It, it packages a lot better. And that's yeah, what we yeah, have yeah. a lot of experience yeah. with. And you have some linear movements when you need to, when you basically take those bar mechanisms that are used for yeah. the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the ankles and stuff like that. So you're basically you're taking a rotary, turning it into a translational or linear kind of movement. To then create another rotary movement somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. fun. I was gonna say, yeah, it's like you have a you have a motor that's rotary and then a gear set that's ro you know. Yeah. And it's yeah. even it's even funnier with linear because it's like you have a rotational motor, a gearbox that's linear, and then you go back to rotary and then back to it's yeah, yeah it can get wild. Yeah, going from one to another. Now, um, I assume these uh, these are your own design, correct? Yes, um, everything in the robot. I mean, yeah, I mean the whole robot. There is almost no off-the-shelf parts in the entire robot. Okay, that's, that's what I assume. And so, mm -hmm. do you have a supplier for the actuators, or are you planning on building these yourself? That I don't think I can disclose, but um, it's it's something. Yeah, you know, like we've looked into. Yeah, um, I, I will assume say, you're able to build them yourself because you designed them yourself. And, the question is when you and, scale is whether you would do that. Or mm -hmm. not. Yes, that that is, as I say, that's the part that, you know, I can't quite answer. But yes, definitely. We, we used to build them all in-house ourselves. Um, and, you know, that will be handled by the production team figuring out how we right. want to scale figure, to that yeah, number. And you, yeah. and some components you might source, others, you know, you'll do local, and then you may do final. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many different ways you can attack that problem. Um, now, um, Digit seems to be one of the more confident bots when it comes to walking. It seems to have mm -hmm. a reasonable walking speed. Do you know what the top speed is? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the version that we just showed, I'm actually not super sure what the top speed is, but the V3 version with a pretty similar leg, it was a little lighter. Um, we shipped it limited to 0.8 meters per second. Sorry, I don't know off the top of my head what's that in miles per hour. And we, yep. you could unlock it on, on the controller to one meter per second. But we, we had two meters per second working in the lab. It was just like it, we didn't want customers running around. Oh, wow. You know? so, so it could go up to two meters per second. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's yeah. in the lab. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good speed. Yeah, usually if 1.2 is what the um, – is, is usually what you'd want to have for a factory mm -hmm. worker. That's the assumption yeah. you do that. And that's unloaded. Okay. When they're carrying yeah. something, then you assume one meter per second. Yeah, and I was going to say, because the you know the distance between that shelf and where they're setting the box is so low, you can't really reach, you know, like you yeah. wouldn't go into a full sprint. The mm -hmm. thing that's actually slowing us down is doing the turning. So we're actually spending a lot of time software-wise yeah, trying to turn faster because you can and see our you're our, not the only yeah. one with a the problem they all have the problem and i pointed that out that's like mm -hmm. you need to be able to do the pirouette that's the big thing to me it seems like it must be a software problem because i assume there should be enough power energy to do it unless it's oh yeah that, yeah it, it, it is just a very hard software problem because um you usually like plan the footsteps and it, yeah. it's a little easier to kind of we call it the trot walking gate yeah and you'll see you know you're like you a tree and I don't know if Figures Robot did it, but like, yeah. you know, you see it. They're, they're, all, they're all doing lot. that. Yeah. It, it's, it looks like they're all, they all need a bathroom break. <laughs> <When you laughs> we get them, that all the time. It. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you, you want to fix that because if you think about it, that little mm -hmm. trotting that you're doing there, that's a complete waste of energy. Yeah. And you know? time. Honestly, yeah. the time oh, is the worst. Time, is the energy. Word. Yeah. You're, it seems like a lot of times you're standing in place, even though you're not moving mm -hmm. because you're constantly trying to do it. And part of it might be, it's almost easier to do that than to stand. Because walking is like a controlled fall and you just want to stay in that kind of controlled fall state <laughs> because your control system is kind of in that mode. And yeah. usually the, the hardest thing is, is standing is easy. Walking is easy. Going from standing to walking <laughs> and walking to standing is a really hard problem. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Very hard uh, problem. And, and can you give us an idea of what the power drain is um, when, you know, or, you know, idle versus when it's really going full steam? Mm -hmm. So the, the funniest, so I'm the electrical, you know, I'm like an electrical engineer. The funniest thing to me when I started, and I confirmed that I was, I was like, originally I wasn't sure it was true. This was like Cassie in the older version of Digit. The computer, just one computer that was on board was using more power than every actuator combined while wow. running, while carrying a load too. That wow. is no longer, I was going to say, that is no, we've tuned it a little bit. I was going to say, that's oh, no yeah. longer true for this V4 version. But as I say, it is very funny. It's like what what is causing you know our power drain? It's not it's not the actuators. You know, it's like okay. at least he, it's you know, unfortunately, it's motor controllers and you know, yeah. you know yeah. other other parts that are in the EE realm. And it's funny how much that adds up in a battery powered device. It's like wow. I almost like I almost want to underclock my computer like to save power. It's just a funny problem. Sure, sure. Or you just need to find different chips or something like that. So is it in that ballpark of around 500 uh, watts maximum? Um, I can't share the battery size, but I can say that we've definitely hit two hours plus on an old version, and uh, we're hoping yeah. to improve it quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I was wondering what the battery I, size is, and, yeah. and, and we were able to see oh, yeah. from that's the, from Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. like, yeah. Te I think I think technically, you know, like old older robots, like Cassie's pack. I think it's public. It's it's very small. Well, it's a big battery pack, but the actual dimensions are very small. Very small. Um, yeah. but it it can handle. So with our robots with low gear ratios, there are huge current spikes, but the average mm -hmm. current load is very small. So oh, yeah. like, yeah, I expect that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you so, can actually so you you can arc well with our battery say, packs. It, yeah. It's less than a blow dryer, right? Yes. Yeah, I was gonna say okay. 500 watts is probably an excellent, and that's for the whole system. And I'll say yeah, that is yeah. not and, the actual. And the reason I'm, yeah. I'm not just pulling mm -hmm. that out of a hat. Oh yeah, yeah. Is, is, no, is that's, that's very close. Tesla, Tesla's officially on the record as saying that. Okay. If max is 500. They expect that the average would be maybe 300. Idle is somewhere mm -hmm. around 100 or something like that. And so we all use that in our calculations here. Well, can mm -hmm. this thing actually make it through? Make the battery life. Shift? Yeah. And you know, for the Tesla battery pack full bore you're looking at four hours but, yes you know, as i was gonna say we, it's closer yeah well as i say when they did the uh, original presentation they're like a whole shift i was like 
how is that possible? And then they look, I'm, I'm very happy. They shared their battery pack size. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, like somewhere between two and four hours. I was like, okay, that's completely believable. And yeah. that, I mean, it's very good. I was going to say that's probably, I mean, that and their yeah, payload yeah, there, is, is like very a, good. A, a 2.3 kilowatt hours is, yeah. is what they have in there. And I've sort of, worked out the spreadsheets to get an idea of how you make it through a whole shift. And it's basically, mm -hmm. well, they take the same breaks that the humans break take. And mm -hmm. if you get like 15 minutes here, half hour there, then you can charge up quite a bit. Maybe you can't top it off to hundred percent, but you can get enough to make yes. it to the next break or the next break. And that's sort of yeah. what we saw at Modex is that you were taking mm -hmm. that approach. And my understanding is that you could have run the robots longer, but absolutely yeah. being in a public forum, <laughs> you just don't want to take those risks. I know what the demo <laughs> effect is like. And again, I, you know, I assume that had you really wanted to hear the, the problem mm -hmm. is you had two different bots there, one with hands mm -hmm. and one without. Mm -hmm. If you, if all those operations were able to be done with the same hands, I assume you probably could have covered that shift with just three bots, one charging the other two mm -hmm. working and you would swap out. But in this case, yeah, you had four bots because you had, they were different style bots and that was like the only way to do it. And I assume mm -hmm. the bot that was charging probably got charged up in, you know, a lot sooner than, uh, you know, pretty quickly compared to when it was time to go and do its shift. Mm -hmm. I would say there were some things for ProPat and Modex that were just like, cause they were convenient for us giving a show. But I was gonna say, yeah, definitely two hours. Um, and then what we've been really working on is not only the battery life, and I'm sure everyone in this space, I mean, electric cars are just like this too. You know, the battery life can be a little worse, but if I can charge in like 10 minutes, that's what the customer cares about is the actual work to charge ratio. Um, right. So yeah, like, you know, like a 10 minute break every couple hours, that would be, to you know, like that would be great. Um, yeah. So yeah. we've, you know, we've been trying to lower our charge time, increase and at the same time, increase battery life because really what customers want is just maximum uptime over the whole day. Yes, absolutely. And the um, the other thing is, I assume you must have had those debates of whether to have swappable or not swappable. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, oh, it was so everyone, everyone got in on that one. Yeah. Um, the real, I'll just say, I would say the biggest thing that kind of was like, we, you can, I mean, you can manually go and take a couple bolts off and change the battery very easily. Uh, so it's like, serviceable we call it the serviceable battery it's yes. not it's not built into the core um so you can swap them but um we found out for some safety regulations it was actually more difficult to certify a battery that was like hot oh. swappable or yeah. you know it was and i was like we could have probably spent the time to certify it to that but at, just at the time we we're like you know it was, oh, it was very similar to tesla you know with their car originally they wanted to swap the whole battery pack in like five minutes but it was like, okay, this is kind of cumbersome. If we can get the charge speed so high, you will not need to replace the battery pack. Yeah. So it, I, I, yeah. And, and the other thing I assume is like, if you really try to make it swappable, you have to add some extra structure in there. And that just like adds mass and sometimes yeah. takes a base claim. And now, oh, we have to go like one battery or two batteries less in order to be able. So mm -hmm. there's all that kind of back and forth. And I agree. There's like, the, one argument I've made is like, the bot is the swappable battery pack because if mm -hmm. it's low in charge, just bring another bot in to replace yeah. it. Yeah. So and depending I, on what that ratio mm -hmm. is, you know, you could have like, you know, maybe six or eight bots while one is charging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no, and we, we expect like, I don't think it was at ProMat, but it might've been at Modex. We had a, we, we've publicly shown a version of our charging dock. So the robot goes, but uh, I think it might've been behind the stage this time. Yeah, it was behind. But, yeah. I said, we, we've publicly shown different versions, one where it's sat and one where it kind of gets the handlebars on it. Um, it can dock itself and charge itself while another robot comes and takes the shift. And because it can charge faster than it discharges, you don't even need as many charge stations as you have robots. So it's like you'll have one and maybe you'll have two robots. Um, now, they did show one picture of the bots napping on the floor. <laughs> I thought, is that like one way of charging? <laughs> it was cute because the bots. Yeah, so. Time. Ah, it's so funny because a lot of a lot of times we would try and hide we used to try and hide like the, the robots just sitting on the floor but we've kind of just been like that's just what they look like we have we have a portable charger 
for when you can't have the big, you know, like the, the thing it sits on or the thing it docks on. You know, it's a piece of machinery, it's a little heavy. So if you need something like briefcase size that you can just plug in, that is also available. And we use that internally sure. a lot. Sure. Now, now as, as far as like the, the infrastructure is, are you designing it to be around like a, a, a 220, 380 volt assumption? That or? That is still, I, like that is still being worked on. Um, I say actually, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty safe assumption you're going to have 220 in just about any industrial environment. Maybe Wait, even the, the funny, oh, oh, the, maybe, the funny, oh, maybe not. This is the this is the funniest thing. <laughs> is yes, we also were like we well we want to charge faster. We'll just increase that. Our own facility for the longest time did not have 220. Um, oh wow, which was so funny. And we're like, oh, it's possible warehouses may not. So we're going to give that option. You're going to be able to yeah. turn down the charge speed to match whatever yeah, kind yeah, of you know, yeah. outlets you it's, have. It's nice to know they could have 220. And even, even then, it's like if it's 110, you're, you're maxing out at 15. And in many cases, they only want you to run 12 volt over the, or, mm -hmm. or 12 amps over the wires. Um, so, well, yeah, because if you're able to get the 220 and if you're going 30 or 50 amps, then, I mean, you'll you'll get it charged up pretty quick. Uh, I think all you need, yeah, probably the maximum would be about five to 10 kilowatt is what you would probably run it depending on the size of the battery pack. So yeah, I was gonna say that's so, all you some really of the, need to set up for. And it's not I, like that. Some of that stuff is like you know proprietary. But I was like, we are still mm -hmm. tuning stuff like that. That is yeah, still. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're, just, we're, I'm just throwing those numbers oh, out no, as, <laughs> as a rough yeah. guess because I you know I know how, how how many how much I need to charge my Tesla at home. And of course, that can take a lot mm -hmm. when you go to supercharger. And everyone's saying, oh, I'll just have like you know 350 kilowatt charge. It's like you don't realize it's like. <laughs> One thirtieth the size of a Tesla battery pack. You cannot put that much in there. Yes, and yes. So you are my, you are you know, thermally limited. Looking at like, yeah, looking at like two kilowatt battery, a two kilowatt hour battery pack, you would be maxing out probably around seven. Or, you wouldn't want to go much higher than that. So it's going to be somewhere in that ballpark. Okay, your blow dryer yeah. is fifteen, you know, fifteen hundred <laughs> watts. That's what it can mm -hmm. do on a one ten. Yeah, that, that is just about yeah, that, 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 the three thousand, yeah. right? But that's at fifteen mm -hmm. amps. Now, if you can bump it up to, to thirty amps, suddenly you're mm -hmm. like, mm, no problem, you can meet it. So you you don't need a supercharger. You don't need incredible infrastructure. Most of the equipment on the floors in a lot of these places is drawing <laughs> close to that. Way more, way more. And some of yeah. them are like three eighty or even four eighty uh, volts. Some mm -hmm. of the industrial robots. Yeah. Yeah. So that I was gonna say that's definitely still something we're kind of working on. You know, um, the the version that so. This is the, I don't know how publicly we're going to talk about it, but this was a kind of a prototype, the version that you just showed. Um, we have that doing customer deployments. Um, and I actually think, yeah, we'll continue using it because it's been very successful. The net, there'll be a next version. Um, and we have announced that there's like a, we call it, we used to call it the partnership program. I'm actually not sure what it's called on our website today. Um, there'll be a next version and it will be slightly different. Like, you know, actuators and battery sizes will have changed from what you're seeing right now. Right. Um, and that's all, that's all to meet, you know, what the customer demands, like they want, you know, more payload, more battery, you know, every, they want more everything, which is funny. That, I mean, that's what customers want. You know, they, they want faster throughput. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's good to be in a place where we have strong customer, like, you know, having customers be like knowing exactly what they want. Um, it's actually pretty difficult to get into that position. Cause you know, if you go to some company that's never worked with a humanoid, you go, what do you want? They go like, uh, I want it, it like, they, they it's like, what are they going to say? I want it to lift 500 billion pounds. You know, I don't want to have to charge it. So being able to work with customers and you've seen like GXO and Amazon publicly, um, it, it takes a lot of work on both sides to kind of work through like, you know, what mm -hmm. is possible and like, what, what do they need? What do they want? Um, yeah. And that's oh. been, that's been a great, like a great thing agility has done really well with, you know, we now have you, a whole team on it. Yeah. You, you mentioned earlier, like the torso um, mm -hmm. doesn't really have any movement because in mm -hmm. many cases, the movement in your torso is kind of a redundant joint. It's nice to have, but you don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to do it. Um, so there's no degree of freedom there. Some of the other bots yep. have two or three degrees of freedom there. Yes. Um, that's absolutely. not a bad design decision because again, engineering is compromise. And yes, it want, is compromise. You know, space, power, cost, everything like that. So this is a question I always ask every time I have mm -hmm. someone on that's worked with a humanoid robot. You are able to add one joint and it will cost you absolutely nothing. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Oh, I love that. Where, where would you put it? 
Nowhere, as I say, the leg is solid. The leg is, you know, the mm -hmm. leg's got as much doff as it needs. I think you're totally right. I would probably do, I, I've never actually worked on a robot with a torso degree of freedom. And you'll notice that a lot of companies that do have them, um, they, they, lock, they don't use them a lot of times because it's hard to control. Um, and they, they add cost and weight. That's why we don't. I would really like to experiment with either like a torso yaw, yeah, torso yaw or a, like a, a torso roll. And that way, and you, you can see it in the Tesla bot video, they have it. So when they walk on the ground, they can keep their knee a little straighter mm -hmm. because they can like rotate their pelvis. Uh, it's kind of yeah, hard it's, to, it's you're, walking, you're walking this way. Yeah. You're talking about, you're talking about being able to do that. Yes. 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 They, and you can, it's actually kind of aggressive in this video. You can see their pelvis like mm -hmm. moving like that. It kind of looks a little weird, but it keeps that leg very straight and straight legs are good for efficiency. That's something I'd like to try, but also I completely wow. understand. It's like, that would add kilograms to the robot and the yeah. and cost. Yeah. So I honestly think it was the, as I say, I mean, early robots, we had like four DOF legs. Like we've only added DOF when absolutely necessary. Right. That's kind yeah. of just been what we've been doing. Yeah. So yeah, that, and I, I would not expect us to be like, oh, I'm going to add this DOF just so I can walk more naturally. Yeah. Um, it's probably not going to be something we do in well, the future. It, it could be. I mean, in some ways it might make sense to be able to make your gait more efficient. I, I could see that for a balance mm -hmm. and everything else. So we may be thinking that's an unnecessary degree of freedom. When Tesla looked at it, they um, there was one torso degree of freedom they didn't put in there, and that's the one to lean forward. And that's the like, one that yeah, I think would. Either. Yeah, I but feel you like don't that really would be the most useful. You can do it with yeah. your legs. It's like this argument yeah. of you because you know people who are younger have that flexibility that they can actually <laughs> bend that way. But as you get older, people like me, when I <laughs> lean forward, I, I look down there. Like, Holy cow! It's really my hip joint that I'm leaning forward. It's not my torso. I don't want to do that. Yeah. It kind of hurts. So. I've looked at that and say, is, you know, is it worth having mm -hmm. it there, not having it there? The other two, I agree. And so you, you can see they made that design decision. You made the design decision, like none at all. So now I'm going to flip mm -hmm. the script is mm -hmm. all right. We got a power problem or a cost problem. You got to <laughs> take one out. Now you got to take one out, Nathan. What, which one do you take out? I couldn't take anything out on the legs, The the six off legs mm -hmm. are pretty standard. It, it, it's redundant in some places like Cassie yeah. had five and before we've done four, but it's like, I, that would be very hard on the controls team and stability wise. I mean, the only place for us that we could take it out is the armor end effector. Uh, and I, it, it would have to be the end effector that paddle, but you know, everyone's moving towards it, more yeah, actuators in the hands. No, yeah. we do not. We, okay. I, we do not have any DOF in the head at all. Um, it would, I was gonna say, one of the funniest things from a trade show is we showed this robot and someone said, I don't like how it walks backwards without turning its head to look. Um, and we actually changed the behavior a little. It has a camera on the back of the head. Yeah, it's got eyes back there. But why I was like, yeah. and no, and I was like, why do you need it? But I was like, oh, that is, that makes people uncomfortable that it would walk without looking. Yeah, I just did it right there. So it's like, maybe we turn a little bit first to kind of give it the, uh, and you'll notice we put turn signals on the head to kind of let you know. It's, yeah. it, it's a funny human, you know, human interaction thing. Now it, it is, this, this is also interesting is the very original Tesla bot design had two degrees of freedom in the neck. And then when they came out with it, they didn't have any of it. So it was like a stiff neck. And again, it just kind of came down to, well, if you got surrounded and everything else and um, it's redundancy, if you want to look that way, just like, Turn your body, or in the case of the Tesla, so, they could turn the torso, or you can do it with your yeah. legs to kind of look that way. So why do I need that? Completely James, not necessary. But yeah. if you watch this video, they added it back in, and exactly. I honestly, I honestly think it was maybe for the aesthetics. Um, and it does look very cool. Honestly, right. like I respect that. You know, it looks and, so natural. Um, yes. It's very impressive. And actually, James Dama has the same theory. Mm -hmm. He thinks it's completely unnecessary and it was all about socialization because mm -hmm. first of all, you now know what it's doing. It's like what it's looking, looking at over yeah. there. You also can see the profile of the face. So there's something about the socialization yep. that makes it a lot better. The other may have been a lot of the telerobotic control. You will see that the operators are like using their head and doing these movements. Yes. That the bot can't do. And so part of it might have, but again, they did the compromise that I keep on saying that as cool as the optimist bot is, it will mm -hmm. suck at soccer because it doesn't have that movement on the head. Right? In order to do a proper header, you need that. So it can do this and it can do that, but still missing one. Because again, 
the engineers are looking at this and making that design decision. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, agility, I, I have no problem with the fact that you guys decided not to put it on there. You, you did something really unique is that the first one had that kind of the day the world stood still kind of vibe. <laughs> what looked like that cone head was like, that thing's frightening. The next <laughs> one we came up with just, it, it was like, you know, it's really likable. Um, it's not I, I'm so glad. And it's well, not I just, Uncanny yeah. Valley. I, you know, I, I look at it and go, yeah, that's fine. That's the perfect solution. Yeah. It's so funny. So, well, yeah, originally just imagine that that white blob on the head was not there. It was just a LiDAR. Um, and I was so used to seeing it. It didn't bother me at all. You know, I come an engineer. I'm like, oh, it's just a small head. We had an investor come in and say, why does Digit have a weird shrunken head? And we immediately went, yeah, this is a problem. And we also wanted to put sensors up there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't say I am. I just want to like the the like two people, maybe even one, designs the entire head very quickly, and we just had like we we had to make it look like that just because that's where um, the sensors were. And I was like, ah, oh, it looks like a marshmallow. I don't know if I like it. And then we showed this publicly, and everyone's like, I absolutely love your cute head. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm blown away. I'm just like that worked out so much better than I expected. Like it went over really well. Like yeah. this was like a quick mock-up uh, of what the head would look like. And then I was like, ah, you know, what about the, you know, like, okay, we'll use the LEDs to make it look like it has eyes. And then everyone responded really well to it, which mm -hmm. was yeah. really nice. That's good. Yeah. Now you can see that the Tesla bot tried to get away from the uncanny Valley of like really yes. putting a face yeah. and everything in there. Unfortunately, they've got more kind of like the Terminator vibe <laughs> with, with that. Just, just so it's like, ah, uh, okay. And, and that's why it's like digit solution is, is that mm -hmm. you kind of avoided that, that problem. We try to avoid it. Yeah. And, and done very well. So you don't really need the head movement for socialization. It seems like with the eye blinking and everything, you've nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. Yeah. And one thing I, I, it wasn't someone at Tesla. I think I was talking to someone at some other robotics companies. There's a couple that have neck degrees of freedom. And they said it's awful for the sensors in the head because now you have that backlash and that movement. And like, for example, you want the camera to be tied to where your torso is, mm -hmm. like where your central torso. And now you have an actuated link between them and it, 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 it adds a lot of slop. So they, I've heard companies saying that they struggled with that a bit. Um, but that's just that's something that, that they can, that's interesting. I, I, I can yeah. believe that because that's a problem in industrial robots as well is that you try to measure stuff like where your, your TCP is and you're not sure if you don't know where that is, you don't have it locked down. You have no idea it is what you're tracking. Yeah. So I can believe that. Now there was the other advantage that in the old days when uh, Tesla, you know, the, the, the first version without the mm -hmm. movement of the neck, they were able to support it with a hook in the head. That's yes. how they actually lifted yeah. it up because it was able to carry the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But now that you have the actuators and you can't do it anymore. So you've got to have the attachment points out there, but you're right. That messes up your sensor suite because you lose yes. your reference. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, not. It's not. It's not rigid. It's. It's. Yeah, um, you, know. and you, see, you can come up with actuators that are rigid enough to do it, but that's the whole point. You don't want it. <laughs> yeah, they, they need to be so small. Yeah, it's like they they're not carrying any weight. You know, there's some cameras, and I think Tesla said their compute is in the head as well. Um, in the newest uh, version. Well, I think or... no, it's actually it's all in the chest. It's all in the chest. Okay. I know. I know. In this one, this one is definitely in the chest. They have a picture yeah. without the front plate. Yeah, I don't um, think they have any compute. If, if there's compute in the head now, that's news to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, 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 I think that was their just original design goal. I just know. This, this is the one where the, the wrist doesn't work right. Okay. okay. Right now. It's like, yeah. yeah. Brain goes back. You're right. You, you, I didn't catch those I, want, I, I love this clip. I, I added this person on LinkedIn right after it because he goes like, yes, uh -huh. it works for the first time. And it, they put it out, which I just loved yes. the emotion he had in the background is so funny to me. He's like, oh my God, it worked. I, I did the same thing because yeah, I, I know that feeling. Yeah. Yes. I, I, yeah. I've got, I've got pictures of me doing stuff like that. And yeah, and you, and you can see the carabiner through the head. That's a little strange, but it is because it was rigid. You could do that. All right. Let me ask a, a couple of questions here. Mm -hmm. um, first about the use case. It seems to me that uh, Agility's um, product right now is mainly looking at warehousing solutions. Um, what's, next or it, to your to the best of your knowledge mm -hmm. it, are there is there an evolutionary next stage yeah. where you look at other use cases and other sectors for deployment of the robot and i was like this is the same thing with the arm dos it was so funny because we didn't design the older version with no head we didn't design it around boxes and 
uh, totes really. The, the box is first and we're like, okay, we'll have it lift 20 kg and it could deliver packages. We just, we like fell into this use case that fit our robot really well. And there was such high demand. And I say, we're definitely not gonna limit ourselves to totes, um, but that is, you know, you'll see it on our website, we have like a list. Right now, everything we're gonna sell the robot for at first deployments is gonna be tote based, you know, putting totes on AMRs, you know, de-stacking de them, things like that. You know, we're working on other things, but it it's a little, I was gonna say, honestly, maybe my, I don't wanna say it great, but I was like, oh, sometimes I wish I didn't have to work on totes all day. Um, but it's a, it's a huge market. I don't know, remember what we used to say marketing wise, but it was over, bill, it was billions and billions and billions just doing like that wall. That one task is hundreds of billions of dollars of market to pull a toad off a wall, which sounds crazy. Um, and a lot of the feedback we get, you know, you see it online, people go, well, I could design a robot that does that tote, you know, on a flat floor perfectly well. And I said, absolutely. You could build a whole robot around it so much better, you know, like uh, like a huge heavy wheel, you know, and grab it, but that's not the point. The robot can go do other tasks. And like, I wish we showed this. This is maybe my favorite argument for the humanoid form factor it was we showed a little video of GXO and I don't think this was captured on video. We did not design the robot to be able to put stuff on AMRs, which is really cute. They have a little wheeled robot come and then instead, you know, like have a, a humanoid take boxes off. That's like the dream collaboration. The problem was when we got there, I, I talked about warehouse management software. We had some, and this is an issue with every customer, don't want to single anyone out. Um, it's hard to get access to customers uh, warehousing management software. And they said, we're so sorry. We, we, like, we can't connect the, the, um, the AMRs to your robot directly. Like we couldn't command them from a computer. And, and one engineer was there and just said, well, there's a button on the AMR that humans hit to dispatch it. So Digit used its hand and touched a screen and controls the AMR with its hands. Hmm. And I've I was just went, that is the whole company. That's the whole purpose of everything we do is to yep. be, there was no change needed for the warehouse. We came, we saw a problem, you know, whether it be stuff on the floor, we're like, and that was, that was a big moment to me. I just wish it was captured on video. It was just like, the engineer just went, there's a button right there. I can hit it with my hands um, and it worked. And we, and we deployed like that. That's, that's the whole vision for the company mm. and for humanoids in general. Right. Now, and now you, um, uh, Nathan, uh, you know, go. that's, that's the thing we hear a lot is like, you know, why the humanoid form and stuff like that. Yes, you yeah. Build hard automation where it's like, yeah, you can, but you might look at it and realize you only need that for like an hour a day and then it's sitting there yeah. idle. Whereas your humanoid bot, you can redeploy it somewhere else. The other thing is the, the legs versus wheels kind of thing. And you brought up the AMR. Oh, the AMRs <laughs> are already the wheeled yeah, robotic yeah. solution mm -hmm. because they're yeah. designed for medium and long haul, carrying very heavy payloads around there. But at the end, you need to have something that is, like you say, the loading and unloading. And at that point, the bipedal bot seems to make the most sense. And yeah, and the, the only alternative right now, yeah, you have the MR runs between. Right. You could have a stationary arm bolted to the floor that lifts the box out, puts it on a, a conveyor belt, conveyor yeah. belt goes somewhere else, another industrial arm. The funniest thing to me, and I like that will be faster. I want to be completely honest. Like, um, we're trying to speed up the robot as much as possible. We're way faster than any competitor is even close to. Um, but that, as I say, that's the biggest kind of issue. It's like we want to speed up, make it reliable, make it fast. But the funniest thing is I can't share the price of the robot, but I can say that like we were an order of magnitude cheaper than um, in, back in the day. Like back in the day, there was a company quoting a robot that couldn't do, like, I don't want to name their name. Now, I don't want to bash anyone. They're quoting a research humanoid that was way less capable than Digit at $8 million wow. um, each. And that's how things, you know, Asmo was estimated at 1 million in, they actually made a lot of them, Honda did. And they just said, we can't get the cost down. So Digit, the cost had been less than that by quite a bit since the beginning. It, we, you know, didn't have that much issue. And now you see companies going, I'm gonna make a 20 grand humanoid. I'm like, no, you're not. I was like, it's gonna be hard. I was like, it's possible. I don't wanna, you know, it's, like. It's, I mean, it's already hard just to get a simple cobot arm. Everyone thinks those things yes. are, are really cheap. They're in the tens uh, yeah. of thousands already. And then you add the engineering around it. And the next thing yeah. you're looking at a solution that's close to a hundred thousand dollars. And you use the key word there, stationary robot. And it's bolted on the floor. Yes. That's what it does. If it needs to go over there, you can't do it. And the other thing is that it might be really fast, and then it sits there and it's not doing anything for a while. 
And then it waits. And the, then it's like, okay, I the, can do that. And so you're not getting the utility yeah. out of these stationary bots. And then you're beginning to find the others. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense on why you have it because your bots deployable. And it's also mm -hmm. able to reconfigure. And like I say, you don't have to change the workspace because mm -hmm. now that we've got these other bots in there, well, now the humans can't really do it because we've redesigned the whole thing around these industrial yeah. bots. We've got fencing around there and all this other no, stuff. No, yeah. yeah. And I say, and the nice thing is like, we're, you know, this is going to depend on deployments, but like, if, if for some reason, you know, like the task changes and you need digit out of the way, you just put the book, you know, like you tell the robots to go charge and you enter and you do the job. You can't mm -hmm. kick an industrial robot out of the way. And one of my favorites, this yeah. was, so this was years ago. Um, we, I went to a, a small automation company and, you know, they, they had some intro, like, you know, they had a lot of tips, like, and we were asking and one of the use cases they showed us, they're like, it was literally like, they're like, I want to put a conveyor belt that is like 10 feet that goes from here to here. And I'm like, I was like, I, why would you want Digit to do that? And they said, that was gonna be over half a million dollars for five feet of conveyor. And it was cheaper to buy more. Like, I was just like, our robots are cheaper than that? Or as in, sorry, our ro how are, you know, how in the world can our humanoid robot be way cheaper than a conveyor belt solution? That's like five feet. But they're like, we have to re-pour the concrete floor. We have to, you know, drill into it. And then the conveyor, which I'm sure is not that expensive itself hire someone to control it, camera system. And I was yeah. just like, th these are the things you learn. Like when you go to customer sites, you're like, oh my God, this is so much worse than I thought. Yeah, Let me and, bring, I was like, I was like, I like, there was a, there was a demo I did where I literally like, I opened the trunk of a van and digit jumped, like digit walked out and we did the demo and then digit walked back into the car and we drove away. Mm -hmm. And I didn't need internet, digit broadcasted its own Wi-Fi signal. It was battery powered. They didn't have outlets. I've given demos like at a building that didn't have power or AC. I'm just like, bam, humanoid robot, let me do some work and you know, leave. It's so weird to explain how important that is, like not having to modify yeah. the building. And, and, and the other thing is that when everyone talks about it, it's like, well, why can't they just automate that? And my glib answer, and I think you'll agree mm -hmm. with this, like, because it was so easy, they already would have. Yes, yeah. I, yeah, so like you said, you know, a small cobot arm is 24 grand, but that's without the vision sensor. And I think even without the controller, the gripper, the grippers are without the gripper, yeah. grand alone. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> also, that is also something we've seen is just like, whoa, these commercial grippers are expensive. Um, I mean, I've seen grippers that were more than, I mean, this, this is off topic, but the, the shadow arm that you may have seen Jeff Bezos use in a, in a popular video years ago, a single hand was 220 grand. They had two of them. The, wow. the robot arm was like 20 grand, but I was like four, like half a million dollars for some hands that can hold three kg. Yeah, so there's things are just, you know, like even if it's cost, like, um, you know, you, you set up in the floor, you set up the control of the robot arm, the perception, the end factor, and maybe that could be cheaper. I'm sure like there's yeah, some companies trying the safety to- safety equipment, you know? Safety equipment. Yes. There are some companies trying to make the price lower, which I, I think is good. That's what we need. But when I go to factories, they're like, we had to hire someone to manage this robot. And I'm like, the company, like the company, like you are just like through them a robot. Like, yes, you can buy the robot, but you have to integrate it yourself or hire someone to integrate it. And that's also very hard to convince people to do. I mean, this is going to sound funny. I, I'm a, you know, like I've worked in robotics for five, you know, what, nine years. Oh gosh, a long time. Um, I had never seen a robot in a factory ever or in a public space mm -hmm. until last week functioning. Like hmm. it, it's crazy. It's, it's all like, you know, a stand, like a very specialized you know, equipment, but like I was at a Sam's club and there was a autonomous clean, cleaning robot. And it was so funny. Cause I was, I was like with my mom visiting my family and she goes, yeah, I hate this thing. It kind of, it's kind of scary. And I'm like, this is the first robot I've ever seen doing real work other than my, it's like, yeah, it's yeah. like so rare. I, yeah. I go into these factories, you know, these big companies and it's shelves and humans and there's no robots. And I think, you know, it's not just humans. We need robot arms to come down in price and be easy to implement. It's just shocking. It, it's so different than what I imagined we would see. So this, um, so, so digital is right now um, a human assistant, right? Not a replacement. 
Do you think yes, this that is this is something will take place in due course? This is something that we try and be clear and we we, uh, we need to as I say every company needs to work on their marketing of it and as I say we tried to lead the way with it. We we will ask companies. We need in our uh, agreement in the Jolly Partner program and I'm, maybe this isn't public but I think it should be the first thing we ask is are you going to lay people off? We're not interested if you are. They need to be set to somewhere else. We're not interested in these companies. You know, no we go to these companies um no one at the company you know, like the employees wants to work in trailers that are 100 degrees fahrenheit it's not just all and dangerous you know it's like n- they won't show up to work and it's not that people are lazy i couldn't do that work those boxes are heavy and i would i would last five minutes i'm i i mean i couldn't handle these jobs um but we very very important to us that people either be assigned a different role that digit can't do we, you know, or they get trained to work with Digit. We don't want people replaced. Um, it's very important to our company. Um, and, you know, mo- as I say, I think most humanoid companies are going to get to the point where they go like, yeah, these are not replacing humans. These are just taking over a couple tasks. There's such a shortage of workforce right now doing these heavy box tasks that um, we, we're just not going to let that happen. We're not going to let layoffs but th- happen. But this is also a scenario that's just mm-hmm. in the interim, right? It's not not in the mid to long term because oh, once you yeah. fill up that shortage, you know, at, at the same time, these bots are getting more and more complex and more and more capable. And mm-hmm. when you... I, I would AI be worried. Mix, yes, yes, yeah. exactly. For example, if figure... Like, I loved that figure video that just came out. We were all in shock. It was great. I, I want to just say that whole team did amazing. Um, like, if if from somewhere we don't know that the world's perfect humanoid hardware with the perfect software, which I know that won't happen, dropped out of nowhere. Yes, I would be worried about layoffs happening and, you know, and people being replaced. Um, I honest, and like, we're struggling now with like AI generated art. You know, there's not news stories where people have been laid off because of it, but talking to artist friends, they've told me that their job, like their um, private, you know, commissions have halved. And it's not, you know, like people are, you know, there's people that are very against AI art, but it's not something I've seen reported because it's hard to quantify. It's just like, I've seen people say like, uh, you know, they're down to a quarter of their work that they've had before. And I think this is a huge issue. And I, you know, like, I don't know how to solve it. I'm not an AI ethics person, Um, but it is a huge issue. And like, sometimes I do feel a little, you know, I'm like, am I doing the right thing? Um, I don't want people to be put out of work because of something I've done. I want to make the world a better place. And so that is something that like, I have to make sure the companies I work with are very, very, you know, um, aligned with that. Like I will not go to work for any company that's just like throw these robots out there. I don't care. Or and like for me personally, I, I will not work for some company with like military. Like um, we were all shocked when um, ghost robotics put a sniper rifle on their, their dog um, right. And agility, I was, I want to give like the biggest credit to Boston Dynamics and agility's marketing teams. Literally the next week we had like eight companies agree. Like we made an agreement between all these companies that have never talked to each other and said, we will never put weapons on our robot. And that was probably like, I was so proud of us, but also the other companies involved with that. Um, yeah. That was, I was going to say, that was like, you know, trying to make things right. Like, robots can be used for wrong purposes and like we have to actively try and you know not make killing robot quadrupeds that are it's like the quadruped was at the height of like one foot i'm like what are you shooting with a sniper rifle one foot off the ground um yeah, yeah. that that was a big day di- i was gonna do, say like do you that think was... it's time our leg you know around the yes. world legislators catch up uh because and, it, and, it seems yeah like, and, and, and once you and know, once again you always oh. played catch up but it's mm-hmm. it just it just worries me that you know th- this is not like anything before. And yes, it's very hard there's, there's to no predict. Coming back from yeah. once you're behind. Then there's no you know, and there's no yeah. coming back. Yeah. Um. And like the, and I was like, if you asked me two years ago, I'd been like, you're crazy. AI is not replacing anyone's job. I would have said that as an as someone who worked in reinforcement learning and robotics, I would have told you we're nuts. I am now slightly, you know, like I am worried about things I'm seeing, and specifically on the armed robots. Like once again, the you know. Boston Dynamics worked really hard, and now in Massachusetts, it's illegal to put weapons on a uh, on any robot. Um, and they did that themselves, you know, not for investor money, 
but out of like what they really cared about the cause and that's really respectable. <laughs> I was gonna say sorry that this topic I know and this this no, comes up every time. I, I I'm but you can't everyone really at, talk about yeah, it. Yeah, everyone at Agility is so passionate about not only like people being replaced, but also like weaponized robots. Like yeah. our CEO, that's what he like uh, former CEO, I was like uh, uh Damien is now the president. Damien literally told us, I think last time we talked to him, he's like, all I want to do is work on this, is make sure it's right, you know, that people are not going to be laid off. Things that are, you know, like legislation and things like that is so important to us. That's important. That, that's a topic that comes up all the time when, mm. when we speak about it as well amongst, amongst our group of, uh, you know, the most important, what's it going to do with jobs? And for the most part, I see it as that certainly in the short term, the short term, I'm really looking at over the decade because we're, we're seeing the yes. demographic. Ten, ten, ten years from now, I am worried. Yeah, It's it's basically, it's going to take care of the unfilled and the unfulfilling. And then, you know, you can put in the three Ds, the dirty, the dangerous, and the dull and, yep. and all that. But basically, uh, that's what's happening is that there's a shortage is going to go in there. Then by the mid, it's possible. But I think at that point, as you begin to see it, you, you're you getting the transition. So so it's not going to be this precipice that we kind of fall off. We're going to be able to see it coming and that mm-hmm. people will be able to transition, begin to realize that's not a career you want to go into because the, the robot's going to be doing that now. You want to be considering something else. And that career may oh, be yeah. something centered I, around that robot, which is the way got, yeah, I've got a good, I've got a good story about that. Uh, there was, I don't follow like hard AI and large language models super closely, but it's impossible to avoid. I don't remember the name of the company, but they released a software engineering LLM called Devon. And we all made jokes because we have engineers called Devons. So we're like, oh my God, you're so good. And, but I, li- the day it went out and uh, you, some people have had access to it. And the day I saw it, I literally saw people say they were going to drop. Thank you. Cognition labs. Um, I saw students in CS say they're dropping out immediately, like legit, not joking. I saw people that were joking about it. And I saw lots of, you know, career professionals joking about it. I saw people very seriously considering changing their career path from one video. And that, that's wow. scary to me. Yeah. Wow. So, so maybe, <laughs> maybe instead of called Devin, it should be called Dexter. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, for example, on a humanoid robot, like we, we, we could not hire enough, you know, programmers, like, we could have thousands. It's so hard to program, like so hard to control mm-hmm. a humanoid robot. But so like I see the alert, but it's like kind of scary. And, you know, for me, it, for me, it's pretty funny because, by the you way, know, I, yeah, thank you. Um, this is a demo of Devin and, you know, you can ask it. I've seen people be like, I want you to make an application for the iPhone that does this. And, you know, chat GPT could kind of do that and it would work sometimes. De- the show Devin like making a really complicated app and it worked perfectly. But then if you wanted to change something, you can ask it to change it. Um, so that's scary for CS. And you know, Jensen Huang from uh, NVIDIA CEO, he literally said, I don't think people should learn how to code anymore, which is, uh, that's very controversial. <laughs> I, I don't wanna like, you know, say, I don't think, honestly, I don't think that's quite true, but like someone that high up, like to be like, we need to, we need to make a big change right now. Like that's how but, important but, you know, this I'll, is. I'll, 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 I'll throw another perspective at mm-hmm. you, you know, for, as someone who's just, so I, I've always wanted to, you know, just build just a simple website for myself. Mm-hmm. And I've always wanted to do it myself, right? Yeah. Rather than outsource it and just hire someone. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great democratizing force. Oh, no, I it is. To, yes. Yeah. You know, interact with, let's say, Devin or mm-hmm. ChatGPT, uh, put in all the elements that I want to and just have it there because it just, it makes, it feeds into my creative process. Mm-hmm. It gives me a lot of control over what I want to put out there. And it gives me a sense of satisfaction of, of creating something that, you know, without extensive Without skills, it, you couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't, right? So yeah. there's the flip side of this also that, you oh, know, yeah, say, yeah. hey, this is yeah. great. You know, but no, it also raises like, so many questions about things like cybersecurity and phishing and, you know, oh, yeah. because <laughs> if bad actors get their hands on yeah. powerful you know, software like this, yeah. it's crazy. No, and like, I... This is very, you know, like everyone will have an opinion on this. I think like, for example, Devin, I feel like this should make the world better. Like if I could have a million engineers working to help me do something, there's no reason the world shouldn't be a better place. It's just scary for me. That's just scary in the short term. Like I'm worried about some friends or something, but no, I definitely like, I'm not going to say like, stop making AI. I'm like, this could, you know, like I could spin up 
oh, if I could afford it, maybe a thousand Devon instances and be like, I want you to make something that makes the world, you know, like I want you to design something that the world's needed, but there was no profit before. Mm. Um, I think it's right. going to change stuff. Right, right, right. I did. Yeah, that's that's absolutely brilliant. I've thought about that. And it's it's just it opened up such a wide uh, array of, mm -hmm. of opportunities that, you know, you just were probably written off because of the cost factor and the yes, exactly. Yeah. It didn't make sense mm -hmm. that companies will not get into something unless it makes business sense, right? Um, I, I'm just curious, what do you think about, you know, the future of, of AI-enabled humanoid bots as, as mm -hmm. you know, just companions and, you know, caregivers and stuff? And how, how soon do you think we're going to actually see that out? out if, it's so funny. Yeah, if you asked me, if you asked me before chat GBT, I would, I would have been like, never, which is uh, looking back really embarrassing. I want to be honest. I didn't see it coming. Um, and like chat GPT trapped and like, you know, sometimes it makes mistakes, whatever. I was like, this is, I haven't heard anyone talk about the Turing test since chat GPT dropped. It passes it. Um, you know, you, people used to I be like, I think we need a new Turing test. Yeah, yeah exactly. I know, there, I know people are working on it, but I was like, I haven't heard anyone. Like we were for decades, people were working on stuff to get past the Turing test and like, you know, yeah. convince you I could have, yeah, it, 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 it Turing test is done. And now we need something harder. Oh wait, what was sorry? I'm off, I'm off topic. What was the original question? Oh, oh AI enabled humans. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was just going off a little bit. Um, yeah. So the figure video that I that we showed really quickly, but um, that is a good example where you have like an LLM to like tell the robot what to do. Yeah. You have imitation. Like this is pretty technical. You have an LLM to kind of like tell the robot what to do, what tasks need to be done. Google did some work with that recently too. This is a great example of it. Um. I think that's that is a great use. That's going to be standard. Um, mm -hmm. And then what you see underneath this is so the guy is saying, uh, like he'll ask questions. This is very similar to a digit demo we did. Is like, you what yeah. do you see? Tell me something about it using your ChatGPT knowledge. Like, what is edible on the plate? Is what he asks. And using ChatGPT goes, oh, of course, the apple. That would be insanely hard to program without an LLM. Mm -hmm. um, but then what you see next is it grabs the apple, and this is actually imitation learning. This is where someone in VR teleopted the robot and you use a neural network to play it back. Kind of like, you know, like a, a Tesla's autonomous cars using driver data to figure out what to do. And then below all of that, that neural network is sending hand positions. There's classical control making the robot walk. So this is a great example of using everything. Very mm -hmm. classic, well, I, I'm you know, some saying classic controls makes um, some people laugh, but mm -hmm. model predictive control, you know, like, you know, it's so funny to say it uses code to balance on, as opposed to a neural net, but um, it's using, you know, a state like a, I don't think they use inverted linear pendulum or anything like that. I'm, they, they've said heuristics is what they used is what they said publicly, but they, they're using, you know, a classical control algorithm like digit uses, and then they're just sending hand positions on top of that. And that is super smart. And I say that gives you all the stability and, you know, like the history of like people working on your, um, uh, your controller like you know decades of research so you don't have to start over but you also get that like oh it, it, i think it's actually coming up right when this video ends i can't remember where it happens and i, I posted this on twitter i couldn't believe it it when it puts the dish away it puts the dish and then the hand not, they did not ask it to do it but from the training data you can see it touch the the basket on the uh, the left side the one where the dishes are it very lightly touches it and makes it even with the table. It's yeah. so subtle. It's like after it put that plate in, I they might cut it from this. But it I was just like, that is the magic of neural networks. Like it it yeah. it, it knew that that yeah, basket it, it was parallel with it. It like it, it, it has like yeah. <laughs> it has it's, like a form it, of ED. Yes. It's, that's what uh, other people call it when I said it. Disorder, oh, yeah. right? yeah. It's <laughs> like people people like it, it learned from the human that. You know, like, yeah. how do you convince a robot that it should have something aligned with the table edge? You know, it's like, no, we, yeah, it, we it learned from, yeah. Now we know so what, what are the laws of robotics we need? Operators was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it sounds like yeah, me. So, I'm like one of those, like, you know, you going to line this yeah, up just right. Uh, I'm like, I know that they, did, they didn't highlight it in the video. I'm not even sure they noticed it did that. Because it, it was like the hand yeah. was sweeping across the table, and it, it just slightly adjusted it to make it straight. And I just lit up at that. I was like, that is crazy. That's the promise of AI. Yeah. 
Um, I know another well, company. Also the bit where it flicked, where it flicked the basket. Yeah. You know, when it was when it had yeah, the yeah. basket to the guy. Yeah, he so knows little things it. like that. Yeah. Yeah, just just tiny little things that. So it's, and, you know, and, we, oh, yeah. we, we tend to anthropomorphize mm -hmm. our interactions with AI, and it's fascinating to see and to kind of look into the future and see, look, mm -hmm. if you're going to have AI in bots that look, that have a human form, it's just crazy to think of, you know, what this does to to our society and our and the way we interact with, with these bots and, you know, mm -hmm. the use cases and all of that. I mean, it just, it blows my mind, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and like so, we were talking about HR, like human robot interaction before, and so like as our company, you know, we tried to be very careful, not make it look too human, mostly from design reasons, but we realized that was a benefit. We refer to the robot as it. We don't we don't call it him or her. Um, we we give it a non-human name, and usually we we don't make the robot talk because well, until literally a couple months ago, there wasn't a technology that could make it talk in a way that was worthwhile to add. But it's like. Mm -hmm. We wanted to keep that it is a machine like you know we wanted to keep that like that barrier like it, it's cute uh, you know it's cute and it look it might look like a friend but it, it is a machine to do work but now that ai happens and like i think in this video i think like the guy it recognizes the guy the guy calls it a name um it has a voice that is based on some a human's real voice um that makes things very difficult and it's like i don't have a solution for that that, that just it's the game has changed like um yeah. these are things i did not think yeah this whole discussion I did not, over, over whose voice yeah. it was, and it just and, yes, and a lot of people talk about how how long it took to for mm -hmm. it to kind of because of the multimodality, I suppose, to translate from you know uh, recognizing the words spoken and then making that is that is that is an inherent thing with LLMs is like there's that kind of delay because you need that much processing power to process your inputs. So that's actually probably nothing to do with the robot. Um, like you know, he talks to it the LLM is calculating and it passes it to the next thing and it starts moving. I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, that's something that could probably be handled. And everyone using yeah. ChatGPT, that's a big thing people are working on is trying to speed up its responses. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, like it sometimes could be in the tens of seconds as you wait for a server to respond. Yes, I love so the discussion of whose voice that is. Uh, Brett Adcock made it. I thought it was Brett Adcock's voice because yeah. he made like a he kind of made a funny post on Twitter like, did you recognize whose voice that was? And so I assumed it was his. And I actually really loved the ums in it. It makes it very natural. And we are all yeah. like, that is the most natural sounding voice I've heard. But I people I've been hearing that people think it's Rob Lowe, an actor oh, from Parks and Rec. I heard that too. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, too. I don't. I have no idea where that rumor came from. And I I'm not good enough to recognize the voice. I think that's just a fun game. It's like, whose voice is this? And they didn't tell people. I think that's just kind of funny. Yeah, do, it is. Do, do, do you think the human might be Steve Jobs, but it's Sorry. it's probably not. Yes. I it's but, one it's it's a familiar voice to me, but I can't. Yeah, it. it's so familiar. Which is why is, it might be someone like Rob Lowe, because you do have some actors like, whose voices yeah. are just are they're very hard to pin down. They're very hard for impressionists to do because they're just kind of so bland. Yeah. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe it could be him. I don't know. I'm, so I'm curious to know what are your thoughts. Do you think the humanoid form is going to be mm -hmm. the dominant form for autonomous bots? Or, I mean, look, like 10 years down yeah. the line? Mm -hmm. My first response is yes. But as I said, it's going to be a bit. And I don't, you know, there, and it's funny, it's kind of like to flip the argument that some people make. Some people are like, yeah, there should just be industrial arms and AMRs. And then if it's needed, maybe some humanoids. Like people are like, there's a place for humanoids. I almost want to flip that argument and be like, eventually a humanoid should be able to do every task. Um, and it should be so cheap that you wouldn't even consider putting in the effort to design a custom robot. But it'll be a bit. Um, I would say I would have said it would have been more than a decade. Because, um, you know, like, Agility was the first company to ever make a humanoid go into a warehouse or do real work. And that was very hard. And, you know, like 20 years ago, Honda made Asimo and they thought like they, you know, like they leased it out to do like demonstrations. When I first saw Asimo, I thought it's going to be five years before I have my own robot. And I've kind of learned since then. I'm like, it's been hard. But, you know, like we we've been talking about figure AI and Tesla. I know Tesla has said a little bit about going for the home market. I that robot is a little heavy, I think for safety reasons. But like a good example is I've talked to One X in Norway and they are very heavily, heavily, I don't want to say pivoting. They did some industrial. They're going to do both. 
but they they publicly said on Twitter, and I, I, I liked it before they deleted it, that um, we're going to sell to individuals for home use, and anyone will be able to buy it with a credit card very soon. And I, I, I mean, I believe them. And, you know, like, and it, they're using very similar, like, you're going to have to teach it through VR. So no matter what, you could have, like, a telepresence. You could just do it remotely. And that's their whole thing is, like, teach it to do home chores. You know, you teach it five times, and it can do that in that environment. And I would not have thought anyone was going to, I'm like trying it. Yes, I get. And I want, that's actually, I would love to have a, I want to, I want to work on robots that can do everything. So like, that's crazy. I love it. Um, yeah. But seeing a company very seriously and um, you know, they have experience selling the the wheeled Eve um, and that successfully doing learned stuff. So like they're, they're on their way. Um, they're, I would say it's hard to say they're, they're kind of a smaller company, but like, they're, it's very impressive. Like, instead of saying we're five years away, we're a decade away from this, they said, this is our business plan. We are going to make this happen um, soon, which is very impressive. Uh, it's like their whole robot design is crazy, but like in a way that I mad respect. Um, it, it, weighs, it apparently weighs 30 k kg, um, oh, half wow. a digit, and could lift more and, you know, has a good back. Like, is it's this crazy. Steve or Neo? This is Neo. Um, 30, and 30 so, kilograms. Yeah. And I, from, it's like, I, I, I saw it at a conference when they publicly, not the robot, like the announcement of the design. Yeah. And my first thought is, I know that number from somewhere, but I couldn't pinpoint it. That is, you can do some calculations in a 30 kg mass falling from like maybe three feet. That is the literal max, but like for like a force imparting on a person in a workplace. So they cap, like the whole design is based around um if it falls like if it falls and it won't i i I don't want to say it won't hurt you um it's a big soft robot it'll it'll probably be fine Mm. but it's made so it from the regulations that existed uh, what little did it should not i think the term is gravious gravously injured yeah yeah grievous that was like that was like from the arm cobot days Mm -hmm. they Mm -hmm. based it somewhat off that and i that's very smart and it's great that's going to be such a lightweight robot it's going to be like you're going to like lift it with one hand but um and it's all cable drives it's everything about is nuts and i i respect that trying to do something different um and i know that yeah it's like they've they've shipped some you know eve robots and they're having good success with that wow Uh as i said that's that's up there with my my favorite crazy robot design is probably neo because it's like I, I don't. Did they buy tech from? Um, was it Giant? Because Giant was doing that with cable. But I, th- I think. No, so I know. Sanctuary I know. Ex- Sanctuary AI did. Yes. Right? Sanctuary did. I have. Oh, I have, because this is Eve a, was. Yeah. Eve was using normal actuators. No, so Eve is cable drive as well, and they've been shipping it for a while. It's all cables, it and is not cable. only really Eve is cable because yeah. it, it definitely it looks like uh, where everything is that's, at is that's, where you would have the motors. The motors okay. are, it is a little strange. As far as I can yeah. tell, the motors are in the same place, but they're just using cables as the gear reduction. So that's why there's some bulk in the arms. Okay. Is because they need that space for like a small gear, like a, a cable okay. reduction. Um, it's crazy. It's absolutely not. So they're not using the cables to like move the actuators um, further away. They're mostly move, using them instead of gears. And it's very cheap. Um, it's very efficient. It's very good for torque control. The gear ratio is super low. So right. they 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 have spent I think they were technically I think incorporated before agility. They spent mm-hmm. the first five or six years making motors, trying to make the like the best motor in the world, so that they could have a low gear ratio. So I, I respect that. Like like really trying to hone they, the technology is very they, cool. They may have taken a page out of it, and a lot of industrial robots were also doing that as well. Is that their wrists were actually being actuated back here? And they yeah. had these really weird kind of drive mechanisms that they weren't chain drives, but they were um, oh, what kind of, it's almost like a, a fan belt. It's like a, I forget the, the term seen, for it. Yeah, d- but, the but, differential yeah, they, wrist. Yeah, but but what, the I way think, the drive mechanism was is yeah. basically was, was something that was like what you'd use for a fan belt, the same kind of material um, yeah. with teeth on it. And so you, you can do that in some cases and actually get, you know, obviously good torque and, and pretty good accuracy. Mm-hmm. So they probably looked at that. Obviously, they're not using that. They've taken it to another yeah. step. They're probably using they think like, it to another step. Yeah, it's, probably using Kevlar or who knows what they're oh, doing. Oh, yeah. It, it's not uh, – it publicly – it's like they, they have some older videos on their YouTube channel, and they have one without the covers, and I looked at it very closely. It is actually – yeah, it's a cable. It's not a belt. It, it mm-hmm. 
I'm, I'm familiar with this because Jonathan Hurst's research before Sering Agility, he done a ton of cable drives. So like, I saw it immediately and I'm like, that looks very familiar. <laughs> Yeah. But they they they've just run with it. They and it's pretty cool. And this is a tangent. Yes. So Sanctuary AI bought the I, I don't want to say leftovers after Giant AI shut down. Giant AI was a company that made just an upper torso. And at the time I thought they were crazy. They were trying to do imitation learning through VR to do tasks. And they had they put out a single video of it working. And ever and I was just like, I've never even heard of imitation learning at the time. This was early COVID, maybe 2020, maybe 2019. Um, and then um, it was very unfortunate. I think they wanted to remain in stealth mode until they were ready, but they ran out of funding. So they posted the video and 30 days later, um, their robots were up for auction on a, like a surplus website. Um, mm -hmm. So if you look back in my Twitter history, you'll never guess who bought one of their robots and it's in my other room. I have a giant AI robot sitting. Oh, cool, um, cool. Um, and it works. Like I, I have now run it because um, Okay, so the reason I bought it was I wanted to look at their cable drives. Um, and unfor like I bought it, and as soon as I got it, it's Dynamixel servos with a, a cable link. And I was like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> it's like off-the-shelf servos, I paid this much for that. But um, it's very cool. Um, and I definitely got it to move. But I can definitely see some of the trade-offs with that cable linkage. Um, there's a lot of uh, backlash, uh, play, yeah. not backlash, but play. Exactly, exactly. And and they only work in one direction, so you got to have it if you want to be able to do the other yep. direction. Yeah, yeah. There's the design of that robot is wild. Um, mm -hmm. It's like all, it's like all three D printed plastic, and all the actuators are in the base. Even though they probably could have been like, because it's not a humanoid, it, it doesn't yep. you know, like they could have put the actuators. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think well, it was about a year or so ago, Robert Scoble uh, did the, the the video there um, when they yeah. were coming out of stealth mode, and it was really interesting to see and to realize that holy cow, they're going to be. And then it, when you think about it from the standpoint of being able to control that thing heuristically. Like this is I've no way. Is so much backlash. Yeah. You'll never be able to. But if you have a, a neural net and if you've got mm -hmm. a good vision system, it doesn't matter. You just keep on doing yes. whatever you have to do. To and that's exactly and that's exactly what it yeah. does. Um, I can confirm. That's what we do. That's yeah. that's what we do, yeah. right? Yeah. Because look at us. We're meat bags, you know. We're meat bags, and that's exactly. What they're, and they're we're robot. cable driven. Yeah, they're cable. <laughs> the robot feels like a meat bag. Um, yeah. I would say I heard through the grapevine that one of the last problems they had was. Um, they would train it on one robot, but the play was so bad it wouldn't work on the next. Like the the robots are almost identical, but the like there was so much play. I've actually heard that also being a problem at other companies using imitation learning. So and I found I I can't name publicly which company I talked to. They said they did find a way around it, and it was just by using more data. They said they just used more robots, and eventually it transferred fine between mm. different robots. It's like the minuscule differences between one robot. And the other that are supposed to be identical, the lighting conditions. If someone walked around in the background wearing a funny colored shirt, that was like enough to stop robots from working, which is super funny. But yeah. if you use them, I've been told and I've seen it that if you use enough data, just like Tesla, full self driving, keep adding data and it seems to work better. That kind of scares yeah. me, to be honest. But it's how everyone's handling it. That's how LLMs are handling it. That's how Tesla's handling it. So I, I, I'm not an expert, so I, I think that's how most people see it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I mean, this, this has been a problem with industrial robots is that supposedly they're all identical and you have one robot and you teach it mm -hmm. with it with the old way. It's like you're literally teaching every location. Waypoints, space. Yeah. It's, it's doing a playback. And so it hits those exactly. And then mm -hmm. something happens to the bot and you replace it with an identical bot and put it in there. And suddenly it's missing the points by a little bit here and there because they're not the same. And then you go in and you, you get this exhaustive file they call the signature file which basically is a mapping from this robot kinematic to the other. So you understand the differences and you're able to accommodate that. So they're probably doing the similar thing there is that you would do, but what, what, what I wonder about as far as I, as far as I know, mm -hmm. um, they do not have, I, I've actually not heard that term signature file before, Yeah. but I, I can tell I, I like publicly at agility, like when we started making 20 robots at a time that were all, all identical, it is a struggle to make them all act the same, even without neural nets. But, yeah. um, as far as I know, like, you know, giant AI and the other companies that are trying to solve it, it no signature file to like no cali calibration of the cameras, mm -hmm. but just add as much data as you can and it should capture the changes is what I think they're trying to do, which is and, really and respectable. Would that work just with the same bot, because this is what I've wondered with mm -hmm. uh, the NVIDIA Isaac, 
Whereas you mm-hmm. put everyone working on that same platform. So if you oh, teach can, a task yes. for digit, could that mm-hmm. transfer over to Apollo? Or would you have so to teach it all there, over again? There is, I was gonna say, that's actually a great question. I have seen people publish research papers where basically they, um, I actually, I didn't, <laughs> I saw I saw the results, I didn't read the whole thing. They, they didn't do it with humanoids, but they did it with quadrupeds. They made one model that could con- control a small unit tree, that could control like an animal, different, slightly different kinematics, but different masses. So I know that's a field of research people are working on. And I do think it's possible. Like um, and if think, you just- um, Didn't Google sort of do something like that last year where they, they were doing a lot of the training with yes, different right, industrial yeah. arms? And then- That one was a bit- so, transferred. Yeah. The, the way they did that was they were just sending end effector coordinates. It still worked, yeah. which is really yeah. great. Yeah. But they, you like, they would like, the neural network output is kind of like how figure did it. The output, like, you know, the position of the end effector and closer open. And then you had your own program on the robot to do it. But like, I, like at, o, at OSU, we literally threw the model in. There's nothing running except that neural network. It does all the inverse kinematics, everything. Um, and I've seen other companies do that. Like that, I call that the crazy approach, the all one neural network. Like, I don't want to do any math, have fun. And the way we solve robot variants that way was we would add artificial noise to joints. Like in, in the simulator, we'd add like, uh, we'd make it up like 10% noise. And that helped, but it slowed the training down a lot. Yeah. Um, so there's there's some papers from OSU about it, but it, it would train, you know, like, you know, it would transfer from one Cassie to the other Cassie, like different bipedal rope, like the same model. So like, I, I know that that we solved, but I definitely think you could make a model that worked on especially if the kinematics were similar, like Apollo and maybe uh, figures robot. Like if it didn't have weird yeah. kinematics, I think you could do it. Yeah, because you know, the question is, okay, it, digit's a little bit different. The, the legs are a little <laughs> bit different. It's yeah. bipedal. Question whether it has hands, you know, what degrees of freedom mm-hmm. do you actually have there? Um, digit and Apollo, they're, they're kinematically the same, but they're also very different because Apollo is all linear drives. <laughs> and, well, and, um, I was going to say, and, and uh, all rotary uh, drive. So if you're yeah, doing yeah. it down at like the, um, the encoder, the lowest level, like, level. that's not going to work. Oh yeah, no, that, that's to too low. Yeah. 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 So we, you have so to do it at a slightly higher level. And the, the, lo- the level we did at OSU, um, in, uh, it used to be Jonathan's lab, like Jonathan's lab, but Alan Fern is now running it called, used to be called the dynamic robotics laboratory DRL now called DRAIL, uh, D R A I L A I. Cause I, we wanted to add AI into the name. Um, we just did PD control all the way down. Like the only code was like five lines of a PD controller, which I love. That's what I can handle. That's like my level of coding. I'm like, uh, you know, like it's so funny. It's like five lines and then every, like a set point, like a position set point. And it was able to make Cassie run. Um, I don't, I don't know if I sent this video, but um, I think the proudest moment, <laughs> I don't know if this is my proudest agility moment, but it's up there it is. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't something I did. Um, they took our robot, Cassie, the two-legged one with no arms, and students at OSU made it run at four meters per second, doubling the top speed of ASMO, and they did it outside, and they made it start and stop. Like, you know, we said starting and stopping is hard. They did it outside on a track. Um, technically, I think it could have set four Guinness World Records in one attempt, but they did the 100-meter dash, and it was a new thing. And I was, there's pictures, there's videos of me like sitting on the sidelines taking pictures because I was so proud. Um, it was like I was watching a living animal. It was so crazy. Yeah. It's it's up there with the craziest thing I've seen in my life. It, I like, I, I don't want to anthropomorphize a robot that we've worked on, but it was like watching an arch, ostrich run. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the feet it was so natural. And like, you know, it started to fall and it caught itself. Um, I was really impressed by that. And I have, I've actually heard that some companies are trying to beat that speed record currently. I can't name who. I don't um, think Unitree is probably going to be the one. because you, you Oh, saw yeah, that you know, that's a good point. The yeah, day. yeah, they did the backflip, yeah. Unitree publicly said they think they can beat it at five meters per second. So they did say that, but they haven't done it yet. But I know some other big players are spending resources to try and make the um, their robots run, which is funny because that's not what we do at, like, at Agility. It was just some you know students at OSU. Um, hmm. I, and it's like some students, but I mean, like it was just such a small team and they just like blew everyone out of the water. I was, it was crazy. Those are some old digit prototypes with different end effectors trying to open the door. These are, these are good, good old days. I, this video was fun. This is when we were just like trying anything, anything like, what can this robot do? We've already sold them at this point to universities and uh, industry for research. And we're like, 
what if we add a risk? What if we dump kilograms of water into it while it's walking? Can it stay, can it keep balance? Can we transfer mass without it knowing? Can we make it jump? Much, can we make oh, how much weight? What, what's the maximum weight it can handle? This one, I think at some point we actually did test 20 kg on an older robot. I think we advertised this digit V3 as 15 kg and that is what I think we're advertising the new version at. And there's margin in there, you know, like for actuator safety and like control. Like right. the hardest part with V3 is V3 could hold quite a bit of weight at its chest. But I remember I used to test it from picking up from the floor. And like that's so much harder controls wise and on the knee. The knee is collapsed. So like it was hard to pick up five kg from the floor, but I'm pretty sure someone like made it throw tw like 20 kg in the air behind its head. I think there's a video privately of an old, old prototype just like waving a box around. Here's jumping. Oh, yeah, like, like jumping. Yeah, um, that there's a lot of fun things, and it's but like you know, like we 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 do have to make money. We have to do totes. It's like we, you know, like we were doing totes, and then in our spare time, you know, like like what if we did this? What if we did this? Um, yeah. Jumping was fun. <laughs> it was so fun. They were destroying like though, because I, I, my job was repairing the robots for a long time, so I knew when they were running weird stuff. Um, surprisingly, they did not break a single robot doing the jumps at first. Like, I don't, you know, like, you know, back in the day, if Asimo fell once, it was toast. They had to replace all the harmonic drives in it that got damaged. With Digit, it can probably fall, like, Cassie can probably fall 20 times. Digit can probably fall more than 10 times. Like, it's just kind of a probability thing. And we're trying to make that way more reliable. Now, there's some, I think this is two meters per second that it just showed it real quick. Um, we were trying to, you know, we we tried to make it super reliable, uh, but it will occasionally still break from falls. But like, it didn't break from like a hundred attempts of jumping off tether. I was like pretty proud of that. And when it does break, sometimes it's just like a cable or you know something got yeah. dented. Well, that, that, so that's the question I have because when, when I saw mm -hmm. the the Boston Dynamics video, that whenever uh, Atlas would fall, it just kind of gave up and said accepted the, its fate that it was falling. <laughs> and you know when when a human falls, we we go oh, into yeah. Fuck. And it's like, well, isn't there some way to be able to sense, uh-oh, I'm falling, and yes, do something absolutely. to actually minimize that? Are you doing so the, something like that? Yeah, there are two. So there's the boss. I don't want to call it the Boston Dynamics method. Their actuators are hydraulic, and they can take yeah. impact. So they just bring everything in. So it can detect when it's falling, and it will usually tuck in the arms so that it doesn't have a long lever arm to break that. What we used to do, and you'll see it in some V3 videos, and I think an alpha video, is we actually threw the arms out like a human. Um, and someone wrote this controller in, I think, a couple of weeks, and we used it for years. And people said it was like the most natural thing they'd ever seen. It threw the arms out, and it could catch itself with one arm um, from hitting mm -hmm. the ground to keep the torso safe. Unfortunately, we did find it put a lot of pressure. If it landed on just one arm that it threw out, it did, it did tend to break that 3D printed part at the end. Um, but it, you know, like the torso would not be as, as damaged. Because for humans, you you could survive a break a broken arm if you impact the ground too hard with your torso. Your organs are in there. That's why humans right. do that. For right. a robot, actually, the torso is maybe the strongest part. So we played around with like, wait, maybe we should just tuck in the arms. It's a funny problem. Um, but my one of, as I say, another, I would say this is the most, maybe the coolest thing agility that OSU has done publicly with AI was there's a video of Digit throwing its arms out to catch itself, um, the new version, Alpha. Um, and, it, and it does that just like V3 used to do. And then an AI model trained in Sim can write the robot. It does it, it like flips around on the ground. And Spot can actually do that as well, the quadrupeds. So quadrupeds can do that. But it was like, I don't, I've never seen it before. Um, and it was all AI and it could like, it was smart enough to write itself, get in the position and get back up all by itself. So it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I fell. As long as the hardware is not damaged, robot can get back up from most positions. Um, and it looks crazy, like in a good way, crazy in a good way. Yeah. It, it's yeah. 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 I remember seeing one of those things where it like flipped over and it's back and then figured out. How yeah. To get back up. Was, oh, that oh, was that all, re like, yeah. that's all reinforcement learned. Yeah. Hmm. And, and then can get back up and go back to work. And that's, I'm sure other companies will try. Actually, I think Boston dynamics recently, very short, they left it in one of their clips there was like a clip of Atlas getting up a little different than it used to. And I'm like, Oh, I wonder if they are trying to get up from like do the flip on the floor, get up from the right thing from a fall. So like, I think other companies will do it too. Um, it's not, you know, it's not like there's, I don't want to say there's not magic involved. I was like, that's not something with the hardware. I was like, that was um, some great work by our software team. Yeah. We have to remember that this is the worst 
this technology will ever be, <laughs> right? We're only going to get better and better and better. And so it, it seems like we're living in, in an era of science fiction. And mm -hmm. I can't help but wonder, I mean, so we, we saw Neuralink reveal its massive success. Do you think we could um, transfer ourselves and our, our ourselves into a robot? I've, I've heard Sanctuary AI is very big on transferring um, human, like that's their one, I think one of their mission statements, which is crazy, is also very wow. crazy, but I, I yeah. respect it. Um, I, well, one, Neuralink scares me a little bit, but is super impressive and will change a lot of people's lives. You know, maybe my mind will change in 10, 20 years, I'll, maybe I'd volunteer. But I was gonna say, this is life changing for yeah. um, a lot of these patients that are paraplegic yeah. or um, hurt in some other way. Um, and I know like this has been like other companies and researchers have been working on this for maybe 50 years. Like I've seen like being able to click a single button, I think in the nineties was possible with and, like, they had to do the thing where they implanted um, some of the, I don't know what to call them, the probes into the brain, which is pretty painful and invasive. Um, but this, I, and like, I saw people trying to downplay it and I don't want to, this is really impressive. Um, yeah. And like this guy, like, I love this. Like I, I stayed up all night playing civilization. Yeah. I'm playing video <laughs> games. Like, that's awesome. Um, yeah. I but think, then some, and this some is, would say, you know, you have this amazing tech, and this is what the guy does. Yeah. Well, no, that's the that's the whole point. But that's like, what life some, is. Yeah, yeah. And when someone takes our humanoid and makes it, you know, do the laundry, I'm gonna be like, this yeah. is why I did this. Um, but for me, th this is just like a sci-fi thing, not based in science. Like you know, when um, uh, on Star Trek, like they would go on the teleporter, like you 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 delete your your meat bag form. I don't want to say kill. You, like you, your atoms are gone, and then yeah. you there's a new version of you. I'm I have a problem with that. It's like, yes, there's a clone of me existing, but that's not me. I died. <laughs> like that's as I say, that's such a weird. Like I can't get over that with teleportation or like you know implanting yeah. my consciousness into a computer. My yeah. it's like that's a that's like a what is consciousness? But I'm like my meat bag is dead. I'm fine with being a brain in the jar where my brain is still alive, but I'm like, as soon as my brain's gone and like, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. That's yeah. just a, I mean, a me. Scott thing. and I are from a different generation. So you, might not get <laughs> you don't want to fly in that. Yeah. The, uh, a few years ago, I think it was, uh, if you ever, there's a YouTube channel. I think it's CPD gray. Mm -hmm. uh, he does a lot of very interesting animated videos that are just really entertaining. And he did one of those about the star Trek, um, transporter. Mm -hmm. And I think he was absolutely correct about it. I mean, he went through the whole thing and it's like, yeah, you're right. You basically, you're, you're deleting yourself and then creating another copy somewhere else. Um, that, it it and, sounds like a nightmare to me. Oh yeah, it, it was. And it was like, his breakdown, it was like, yeah, that's exactly how it works. I haven't it's actually seen you. that. I have to go, I know that channel. No, look, I'll have to go watch it. that. And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. It's you, you will agree with it a hundred percent. It's like, after you, you see that, that's like, that becomes your, Mm -hmm. kind of a reference point for philosophy when it comes to this whole idea of teleportation and how it would work. <laughs> oh boy, this has been such, I mean, we've, we've gone down the rabbit hole with this and I absolutely love it. <laughs> but uh, we have to wrap this up here. Mm -hmm. um, it's been so wonderful having you uh, on the podcast, Nathan. Mm -hmm. And uh, Scott, as always, you know, this. what would I do? What would all of us do without your insights mm -hmm. and your experience uh, when it comes to understanding these mind-blowing technologies so thank you so much both of you uh let me just pull up your uh your social media profiles so mm -hmm. people can you know reach out to you if they want this is nathan on x uh and here he is on linkedin, on LinkedIn. And of course yeah. yeah so um you can reach out to nathan either ways um and of course going ballistic five is where scott walter is on x thank you again Gentlemen, it's been such a pleasure. You know, I have a feeling we're going to be picking this up and taking this forward very soon. <laughs> yes, uh, I think so. So thank you, Royden, and thank you, Nathan. This was yeah, this was a fun chat. Yeah, this is a, this is good. <laughs>